Well, good morning. My name is Dave Miles, and it's my great privilege to be one of the pastors here at Moraga Valley Presbyterian Church. We're glad you're here. I want to invite you to stand now and join us. We're going to do something a little different today. As you know, we're heading towards St. Patrick's Day. It's next week on the 17th. So we're going to actually begin by reciting what's known as St. Patrick's Breastplate. He was, a, uh, a, he was enslaved in Ireland, uh, left his slavery, came to Christ, and then went back to Ireland to share the gospel. So please join me as we recite one of these teaching tools that St. Patrick would use to teach the Irish about truths about God and Jesus Christ. So please join me reading together thoughtfully beginning. I rise today in power's strength, invoking the Trinity, believing in threeness, confessing the oneness of creation's creator. I rise today in the power of Christ's birth and baptism, in the power of his crucifixion and burial, in the power of his rising and ascending, in the power of his descending and judging. I rise today with the power of God to pilot me, God's strength to sustain me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look ahead for me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to protect me, God's way before me, God's shield to defend me, God's host to deliver me. And really, this is a reminder of what the power of God does for us as we put our faith in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So please join us, stand, whether you're on the patio, our home, in the worship center, as we worship. Let's all put our hands together this morning.
give a praise this morning, church.
Well, welcome again to Moraga Valley Presbyterian Church. We're so glad to have you with us. My name is Dave Ricketts. I'm one of the associate pastors, and we really want to be for La Mirinda. We want to be for our people and our community here that God has placed us in. And one of the ways that we're going to be doing that is Easter is in just a few weeks. And we want to have you begin to invite your friends and neighbors to join us here on Easter morning. We have a Good Friday service that will be on Friday, April 2nd, here in our worship center at 7 p.m., But then we also have Easter Sunday that's coming up just two days after that on April 4th, 9.30 and 11 a.m. We will be here on our campus. We will be in this building as well as on the patio, both at 9.30 and 11. We'll also be online. And we'd love to have you begin to sign up for that in just a couple weeks. So begin to invite your friends. Let them know it's coming. We are so excited to have live worship back here in our worship center for that day. This morning, we are also excited because children's ministry has started back up. Children are on our campus again for the first time in a year, and we're so glad to have them and their parents joining us for worship outside on our patio today. Great to have you with us. Yeah, absolutely. Big applause. Parents, we'd love to have you join us again next week. Bring your children back. We would love to connect with them. Let the children connect with each other and with Jesus and our children's ministries that we'll be meeting uh, on Sunday mornings. And you can come outside and enjoy a beautiful day of worship on the patio. Next Sunday is uh, the 21st, and it is also the day that we are doing our summit number two. We will be here on our patio beginning at 11 a.m. So if you want to come to worship that morning and join us on the patio, you can then just kind of stick around and stick around for summit number two. We would invite you to be in prayer for that. We really want to seek God's face and hear what he is saying to us as a church. And Uh, These summits are a big way that we're trying to do that and move forward with that. So please join us for that and be in prayer for that as well. Well, this is a time in our service where we uh, give our offering and we offer our gifts to God to use in his kingdom. As you give today, whether it's online or if you, you can use one of the boxes that's at the back of our sanctuary, if you're here with us, or on our patio to give, I want to invite you to listen to another story of one of our partners in ministry, Amore Ministry. Watch this. My name is Forrest Fowler, and I'm part of the team at Amore Ministries, and I'm excited to share with you the kind of impact that you can create through your participation in the Easter offering. As a 2013 recipient of this offering, Amore used the funds to upgrade, outfit, and supply our La Cocina kitchen so that we could better serve the groups. Prior to receiving this gift, our La Cocina team members were cooking on small campfire stoves underneath carport canopies out in the middle of a field. They were exposed to the elements and the environment, and if you've ever been on an Amor trip, you know what a dirty and dusty place the Amor campground can be. This gift holds a special place in the heart of our co-founder, Gayla Congdon, as one of her love languages is hospitality, and she sends you a special thank you today. The the upgrades that you made possible through your generosity have made the La Cocina program safer, more comfortable, and more efficient, and more welcoming. Uh, It's been a, a place of joy for our La Cocina staff and for the groups that we serve. Since June of 2013, more than 14,725 people have enjoyed meals and fellowship through the La Cocina program, and that in large part is thanks to you. Your generosity during the Easter offering campaign is life-changing. It impacts thousands and has a lasting effect on both the organization that receives the gift and those that they serve. On behalf of the entire Amore Ministries team and those that we serve, thank you. Well, we have been in partnership with Amore Ministries for more than 30 years, which is about as long as it took for us to grow that beard. But uh, we were actually in Mexico the week that they dedicated this kitchen. You can see a picture there of Gayla Congdon and one of the leaders of the La Cocina program they have there as we were praying. And then we got to be there as they dedicated that whole thing uh, and set it to use. While we have not been able to take our annual trip to build houses because of COVID this year or last year, we have been able to have more than 5,000 high school students 
and adults participate in these trips, building more than 400 homes over our time with the Moor. And we eagerly anticipate returning back to La Casina again soon. I trust that you were encouraged uh, as you heard about the offering that we gave several years ago and how it continues to have an impact. We look forward to the Easter offering this year and wait with anticipation how God is going to use those funds again this coming year. Thank you. My name is Dave Miles, again, I'm one of the pastors here, and it's my privilege to be a part of this ministry now. It has been nearly a year to the day that we all went into lockdown, different states went into lockdown at different times, and so just by way of reminder, uh, you know, we're going to take a time to uh, really to pray and ask God's blessing on our country and our world community as we continue to struggle with this pandemic, so please join me in prayer before we head to uh, the Word and the time in the in, in ministry of the Word. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we are stunned, uh, astonished, in fact, at your greatness. And we admit that we're no near as, nowhere near as great as we think a germ lord has shut down our world community, taken the lives of two and a half million people. And Father, we are sobered when we think of this loss. We praise you, Lord, that we live in a world where there's a vaccine, and we praise you for the different companies and people that have created this and asked, Father, that it would continue to be disseminated in this country and around the world. So, Lord, we also confess that we have sinned against you, Lord, through our own fault and thought and word and deed and things that we've done and things we've left undone. And so for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord, forgive us our offenses and grant that, Lord, we may serve you in newness of life. And Father, for our nation, uh, we pray for our president and Congress that they'd work together to bring us out of this pandemic. We pray for our business owners, for their prosperity, and for the business owners in this church. We pray, Lord, for their success. We pray for people whose lives have been irrevocably altered as a result of the, last, the events of the last year and ask for your mercy for them, especially, Lord, those who live in cities around us Oakland and San Francisco and Father for our church as we continue in this transition we pray for the focusing process that we're in and the future search for a long-term long-term lead pastor Father grant us grace in this time of a people we pray these things in the beautiful name of Jesus amen okay we have been in the book of Nehemiah for quite a number of weeks now we're going to head into chapter 13 it's the last chapter in the book of Nehemiah so please open your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 13. Now, uh, I'll be reading from the New International Version of the Hebrew Scriptures. We need to understand uh, that this is a long chapter. I'm going to read verses 1 to 11, verses 15 to 16, and then in verses 20 to 26. So I just want you to keep that in mind as I kind of jump around the, the chapter here. So Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 1 to 11, 15 to 16, and 20 to 26. Hear the word of the Lord. On that day, the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people, and there it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God, because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam to call a curse down on them. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. And when the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign descent. And before this, 
Eliashib, the priest, had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah, and he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offering and incense and temple articles and also the tithes of grain, new wine and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians, gatekeepers, as well as the contribution for the priests. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Some time later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. And here I learned about the evil thing that Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the court of the house of God. And I was greatly displeased and threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms, and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. I also learned that the priests assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and that all the Levites and the musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. And I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? And then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. Now to verse 15. In those days I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys together with wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore I warned them, against selling food on the Sabbath. People from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath day to the people of Israel. Now, to verse 20, once again referring to the Sabbath, he goes back, he says, once or twice on the Sabbath day, uh, once or twice the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside Jerusalem. But I warned them and said, why do you spend the night by the wall? If you do this again, I will arrest you. And from that time on, they no longer came on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and go and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this also, my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. Moreover, in those days, I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, or the language of one of the other peoples, and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. And I rebuked them, and I called curses down on them. I beat some of them, the men, and pulled out their hair. I made them take an oath in God's name and said, You are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. Was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, had sinned? Among the many nations, there was no king like him. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel, but even he was led into sin by foreign women. This is the word of the Lord. Now, this is a confusing chapter. I hope I can unpack it for you, okay? <clears throat> Let me take you on a little history lesson here. It was June 5th, 1944, and much of Europe held its breath. The Nazis had experienced a stunning loss at the hands of the Russians, and uh, they knew that the invasion of Europe was right around the corner, and that were they to lose that battle, those series of battles, then the nation as they knew it would never be the same. So in preparation the German army under the command of Erwin Rommel had fortified the 3,000 miles of coast that they had to defend in northern France, setting up lines of fire, littering the beaches with mines, obstacles known as Rommel's asparagus, and building large concrete fortifications with huge cannons. And Rommel knew that, you know, that the first 24 hours of the invasion would be the deciding factor in the war. In fact, he told one of his aides, it will be the longest day. And that phrase eventually became the title of a book 
used to describe the operation and the title of a major motion picture in 1962 starring John Wayne and a whole host of other characters, major actors at that time. Now the timing of this operation was mission critical. It was, it was already a difficult. It was dictated by a variety of factors, including the tide, the full moon, and the weather. And to that point, the weather had not cooperated. The invasion had already been delayed by a day, and the weather wasn't looking good. Eisenhower wasn't sure what to do. But consequently, a, a window appeared. Uh, the weather people said, yeah, it's, it's clear. So Eisenhower gave the go-ahead. On June 6, 1944, what we know as D-Day, a fleet of more than 5,300 ships began to cross uh, the channel. It included, it was like moving a small city. 150,000 men, uh, 12,000 aircraft, 1,500 tanks, airplanes dropped 24,000 paratroopers behind enemy lines in France, June 6, wee hours of the morning, uh, you know, and here's the point. While this was all going on, everybody knew this was going to happen soon. And with the stakes so high, where was Hitler? Where was Rommel? Well, Hitler was asleep. He had a habit of going to bed 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, getting up between 11 and 2, and his aides dare not wake him when he was asleep. When they finally did wake him, he even then didn't believe the invasion was actually real. And Rommel? Well, with the weather so bad, he decided that no one in their right mind would actually launch an invasion with that kind of weather, so he had driven back to Germany to give his wife a pair of shoes for her 50th birthday. And so in short, two of the most important leaders in the German army towards the end of World War II at the time, that weren't paying attention to what was going on on that morning of June 6th, 1944, when the Allies attacked the Norman coast. And as Rommel had predicted, by the end of the first day, after 10,000 casualties, nearly 4,500 Allied dead, 10,000 Allied casualties, nearly 4,500 people killed, on that day, the beach was secured and the outcome of the war was virtually certain. Now here's the lesson. Pay attention. Pay attention. In fact, Peter tells us the same thing in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. When speaking about the Scriptures, he says, you do well to pay attention to it. So that is, in fact, what we're going to try to do today in this very, very unique passage of Scripture. As we head into the final chapter of the book of Nehemiah, we see Nehemiah telling us in a roundabout way, pay attention. Pay attention. So by way of reminder, Nehemiah is the story of this Jewish cupbearer to the king of Persia who went to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall and rebuild the people of God. It's an amazing story and study of leadership and human nature. And so as you head into the final chapter, again, by way of reminder, in chapters 1 and 2, we see that God gives them a vision, a vision to, to be something and do something that they were called to be. They begin to follow that vision. In chapter 3, we see the nation of Israel beginning to act like a community where they rebuild the wall together, chapter 3. In chapter 4 and chapter 6, they begin to experience opposition from outside the community of faith, and they deal with that. And then in chapter 5, they experience opposition within the community, justice issues, greed, they dealt with that. Finally, in chapter 6, the wall is rebuilt and the people begin to live out their national purpose to show the world what friendship with God looked like. Then, in chapters 7 through 10, we've got the people begin to develop their character and face their personal and spiritual issues. They are getting their spiritual lives back on track. That's chapter 7 to 10. Then chapter 11 to 12, which we spoke about last week, they are reestablishing a robust sense of worship. So they have rebuilt on a physical level. 
They have rebuilt on a social level. And now they've also rebuilt on a spiritual level. And when it all seems to be going great, Nehemiah takes off, heads back to Persia, and then reality hits. And much of the spiritual and personal ground they've gained is given back. And we got to ask, why? I mean, this is a fascinating study because truth of the matter is, this is the last chapter in the last book chronologically written in the Old Testament leading into 400 years of silence before the time of Christ. The last thing they hear is chapter 13. And what we see in this passage is Israel didn't pay attention. Israel didn't pay attention. So let me tell you the story, and we're going to unpack it best we can. <clears throat> Israel didn't pay attention. Now, following the dedication of the wall, Nehemiah decides to go back to the king of Persia. He's going to give a report. And the timing of the whole thing is kind of unique. Truthfully, nobody that I've read can actually figure it out. Everybody has differences of opinion. But people say that he was gone between 5 to 12 years you know, following the completion of the wall and setting up all this stuff, he's, he's gone. And when he gets back, he's horrified by what he finds. Everything that he's put his time in, everything his time and energy has been put into has unraveled. And it's frustrating. And you can see it in all the terminology that he uses. You know, he says, I confronted them three times. I beat some of them. I pulled out their hair, verse 25. I, I, <clears throat> I uh, rebuked them. I called curses down on them. I was angry. I warned them. I said, you keep this up, I'll arrest you. Now, we may look at this passage here and say, you know what this guy, Nehemiah? Like, he needs therapy. I mean, the guy's totally unhinged. He needs a sensitivity class, maybe a ma an anger management class. And the fact of the matter is, when you look at this, he probably crossed some lines. Now, there are a lot of scholars who will say that, you know, that these were, you know, for example, pulling out hair and beating people. This is not what it looks like. It was probably kind of a formal way to punish people that was acceptable back then. You know, he's just not grabbing people and getting in fist fights and yanking out people's hair. But what bothered him is that the distinct relationship that the nation of Israel had with God had been jettisoned again. It was like they never learned the lesson that they experienced in the exile 150 years earlier, which tells us that reformation is never simply a matter of what you do but who you are. It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. In fact, in many ways, what they needed to deal with and promise not to do in chapter 10, they go ahead and do again anyways in chapter 13. Now, based on their example, there are three large things that come out of this text, okay? Three large things that we need to pay attention to as we consider ourselves as a church, where we're at, you know, in our history, and what we can, and as we consider our own lives, three major things, and then a fourth thing that's kind of a surprise. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at those three things and then the fourth thing. So first, what we see in this text is pay attention to what you believe. Pay attention to what you believe. This is verses 1 to 3. Now, here's what happened. The nation of Israel fudged theologically. They had invited pagans into their faith communities. Now, one of the things that made Israel distinct from every other world religion is the belief in this one God, a belief that they expressed in what was known as the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And they were to repeat that to their kids. It was a discipleship tool. That was what the nation, they built their whole theology about this. But here, they welcomed foreigners with a completely different view of God into their midst. 
Foreigners who believed that God was uh, an idol, wood, stone, or metal. In fact, the people described in this text, Amorites, Moabites, had a long history of doing this thing. All the way back to Numbers chapter 22, where this guy named Balaam, quite the rascal, uh, influenced the nation negatively. And the, 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 these people, the foreigners, were eclectic, open-minded, and had taken religious tolerance to its natural conclusion, meaning that you could believe anything you wanted about God, and that was fine. Now, Nehemiah knew that wouldn't work, so he's telling us, pay attention to what you believe. Now, some of us might here may say, <clears throat> some of us watch may say, well, what's, you know, What's wrong with, like, believing anything you want about God? I mean, after all, we're told today that all religions are essentially the same. All roads lead to Rome. Uh, you know, there are many paths to salvation. No one has any superior religious knowledge to, you know, to God than anyone else. And as one of my friends has said to me repeatedly, Dave, different teams, same soccer field, different teams, same soccer field, but Nehemiah knew that wasn't the case, which is why he was so upset. So let me explain briefly, because this is such a big issue today in our churches around the United States. Listen to me. Any truth that is essential to a belief system cannot be taken away without destabilizing the whole police system. Any truth essential to a belief system cannot be taken away without destabilizing the whole belief system. So what was at stake here was the very survival of their faith. Let me give you an example. If I'm on the board of Greenpeace and I come out saying that climate change is a hoax, the other board members would ask me to resign, and rightfully so. I could call them narrow-minded, I might even call them bigots, but they'd be right to ask me to step down. Because for Greenpeace to survive, that belief system, you know, climate change is not a hoax, had to be maintained. Now for us also, if you take away the deity of Christ, if you take away the atonement, if you take away the authority of the word of God, the virgin birth or the second coming, it unravels the whole things. Ideas have consequences, as Richard Weaver declared in 1948, and that's what you have here. And Nehemiah understood that. So he was rightfully upset. And for us, this is a challenge, a reminder. As a church and as individuals, we need to pay attention to what we believe. Pay attention to what you believe. It matters. It matters. But there's a second thing that Nehemiah discovered. It's a problem as bad as the first, and it is this. We are to pay attention to our use of power. In fact, what we're going to see in this text is that we are paid to pay attention to leadership and the use of power. Now, let me tell you, that's verses 4 to 9. Every one of us exercises power to one degree or another. And in this text, what happens is, happened is they misunderstood and misused their power, and we can do the same. Here's what happened. The nation of Israel, the leaders in Jerusalem, had invited an enemy with wrong motives into a place of influence. The guy's name was Tobiah. He was one of the detractors described in the book, chapter 4, verse 2, who famously said about the wall, if even a fox were to run on it, it would fall down. And yet, because Tobiah had relatives in high places, he was allowed office space, an apartment in the temple compound. And virtually every scholar I read noted that by being there, he could exercise influence over the people of Israel. He was an opportunist, he was a profiteer, maybe a gold digger, and he literally takes up space in the temple compound and replaces uh, he replaces where they're to store objects of worship. And this all happens with the approval of the religious leadership. It would be like inviting Osama bin Laden into some office space in the Pentagon 
after 9-11. It would be like giving the Communist Party members who shut down information on the coronavirus while it was spreading around Wuhan, it would be like giving those people a seat on the board at Mayo Clinic. And what it said was that after Nehemiah left, people in power didn't use their power wisely. They used it for themselves rather than for the good of others. And this is a reminder to us that Christianity is not about powering up on people. It's not about our political capital or the positions that we hold. It's not power over, but power under. It's servanthood. Jesus Christ, we're told, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And when we grasp that, our focus of attention as a Christian church won't be so much on our power, but on our faithful presence in the communities in which we live, as James Hunter calls it, our faithful presence by which we live out the kingdom of God. So pay attention. Pay attention to what you believe. Pay attention to how you use power and authority. Pay attention to leadership. But there's one more big ticket item here, and this perhaps is the most important, and that is this. Pay attention to your spiritual formation. Pay attention to your spiritual formation. In fact, that's verses 10 to 28. This is so important that our next sermon series, which begins next week, is going to be on spiritual formation. Now, here's what, here's what happened. There was a spiritual lethargy that was reflected in the nation's failure to practice certain spiritual disciplines. And by spiritual disciplines, I mean spiritual practices that deepen our walk with God. And there are three practices that are actually mentioned here in this text. The first, from verse 10 to 14, is giving. The spiritual practice of giving. Now, I want you to know, they needed to pay attention to their spiritual formation by paying attention to giving. Now, I want you to notice how often this is mentioned in this book. It is mentioned in chapter 5, chapter 7, chapter 10, chapter 12, and now again in chapter 13. And that's because generosity is a byproduct of spiritual maturity. So Nehemiah naturally brings it up over and over and over again. In fact, it happens so often that I have not personally mentioned it. Just don't want to wear people out over the whole thing. Now in this case, the nation of Israel had quit giving and their giving was so poor that the religious leaders, the ones who led their worship services, had literally fled. That's the actual translation of the Hebrew word. Fled to their fields so they could survive. Pay attention to your giving. Carl Messenger who was a rather famous psychiatrist back in the 70s, wrote a great book called Whatever Happened to Sin, once said this. He said, money, the guy's not a Christian. He said, money giving is a good criterion of a person's mental health. Generous people are rarely mentally ill people. And what Nehemiah is telling us is that giving is an indication of spiritual maturity and a way to avoid spiritual lethargy. It's a spiritual discipline. Pay attention to your giving. Then Nehemiah goes into another spiritual discipline. The second is Sabbath rest. That's verse 15 to 22. Okay? Sabbath rest. Pay attention to spiritual formation as seen in your Sabbath rest. Now, for the Jewish community, Sabbath rest was a pointer. It pointed to God's creative creation Back to Genesis 1 to 2, where God creates order out of chaos. And it points to God's redemption, book of Exodus, where God liberates people out of slavery. See? So in both cases, Sabbath rest is a call to stop, rest, delight, and contemplate the God who creates and the God who liberates. It's the sanctified wasting of time because in fudging on sabbath rest the nation of israel and in many cases we do the same thing was in fact fudging on their walk with god it was an indicator of their spiritual lethargy how are you in terms of sabbath rest and then finally the spiritual formation as seen in the discipline of 
marriage. Marriage. Now, I'm going to suggest, and we see in this passage, that marriage is actually an intentional practice. It's an intentional, the intentional practice of marriage is a discipline of the Christian faith. A guy named Gary Thomas wrote a book called Sacred Marriage, and the subtitle of this book is, What If God Designed Marriage to Make Us Holy More Than to Make Us Happy? Now, in this case, it involved Jewish men marrying foreign women. Again, the issue wasn't the foreignness of the women, but their faith. The children coming out of these unions could not even speak Hebrew, meaning that they were not being taught to worship Yahweh. There was no family discipleship going on here, and it also meant that Judaism was one generation away from total extinction. It was as if they completely jettisoned what happened 150 years earlier. Now let me speak to Christians who are married for a minute. When I, say Christ, when I say that marriage can be a discipline, what I mean is that the way you handle your marriage and the children out of that marriage makes a contribution to your discipleship. If you ignore the development of your marriage, you bypass the spiritual formation that God has for you through those important relationships. Marriage and child rearing are in fact chisels in the hand of the divine sculptor to shape our character and mold us into the people that he wants us to be. Pay attention to your marriage. Now, listen, one of the best things that Jan and I have ever done was pay attention to our marriage as a spiritual discipline. Around year 20, we hit what I have called, uh, it's the seven years of marriage purgatory. I mean, people weren't screaming or threatening divorce, but it was a grind. And as we paid attention to this, our kids noticed, you know, and to this day, they will make comments about how our work on our marriage has actually shaped their own lives and even their own marriages as well. Are you paying attention to your marriage. Pay attention. Now here's the bigger question. The question isn't why this happened or even what happened. It's actually, well, it's, it, it is why. And even bigger, the question is how can we keep this from happening to us today? Because I'm going to tell you that this is our story. This is my story. This is our, we don't pay attention. The radical self-centeredness of the human heart drives us inward and blinds us to the reality. As one person put it like this, what the heart desires, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. On our own, we're just like the people in Nehemiah chapter 13. Luke Ferry, who's not even a Christian, in fact, he's an atheist, says much the same thing in his book, A Brief History of Thought, when describing our Western society. He notes, he says, not only does nature no longer seem remotely good most of the time, but mo uh, mo uh, good, but most of the time, men find themselves having to oppose the natural order to arrive at any notion of good. And this is as much the case within ourselves as around us. If I listen to my inner nature, says Luke Ferry, it is an uninterrupted and insistent babble of egotism that speaks, urging me to follow my private interests to the detriment of others. So if that's the case, what are we supposed to do? God wants us to pay attention but we don't. What do we do? Well, in Nehemiah chapter 22, we are given a hint. It's the word loving kindness in Hebrew, interpreted as love here in the New International Version, and it points us to this thing called grace. And this is the fourth and final point and the surprise. We are to pay attention to grace. Pay attention to to grace. Now, grace is the unmerited favor of God. It is the radical generosity of God who, through no merit of our own, 
delivers us from our sin and develops us into the people we are created to be through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Pay attention to grace. And Paul says that grace teaches us, tutors us, empowers us, even enables us to stop doing what's wrong and start doing what's right. Pay attention to grace. So for example, in Titus 2 we read, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Grace enables us to pay attention to the things that we need to pay attention to. Grace understands that there's nothing we can do to make God love us anymore, and nothing we've done will cause him to love us any less. So we can face reality without fear. You cannot buy grace, you cannot barter for it, you can't earn it, and once you get it, you can't send it away. In fact, you won't even want to. One of the foundational principles of our theological truth here at Moraga Valley Presbyterian Church is the perseverance of the saints. That's rooted in grace. And if you understand grace and someone confronts you with an issue in your life, you're more than likely to say, well, you got me, you don't know half of it, and it's worse than you think. Grace frees us to face the reality of our own junk. My friend Bill Porter once said, grace doesn't sell. You can hardly give it away because it works only for losers and no one wants to stand in that line. Grace cancels cancel culture because cancel culture is based on adhering to some arbitrary standard of political correctness. It's performance-based. But grace tells us that no one measures up to God's perfect standard of correctness. We all need grace. Grace will give us the courage to deal with our stuff because grace is received, not earned. And paying attention to grace will free you to face the spiritual warnings in your life, small or big, small breaches of integrity, small moral boundaries that you slip over, and grace will free you to make things right when you mess up because we all mess up. Pay attention to grace. Nehemiah 13 is a very unsettling chapter. And he's trying to tell us if we're to face reality in our own lives, we need to pay attention, but we don't pay attention. So what we need to pay attention to more than anything else is this gospel of grace. Now let me close with a story. It's a true story. Those of us who serve are familiar with what is known as a riptide. And more often than not, when you go to beaches in different parts of the east and west coast, there are signs that warn beachcombers to stay out of the surf because of dangerous riptide. Now, surfers love the riptide because the riptide takes you out beyond the break. What a riptide is is the waves come in, the water comes in, and then it's got to go out. And so it goes out in the easiest way, and wherever that easy, you know, way is that's called a rip and it's a very strong current you could be an olympic swimmer and get caught in that current it'll take you out to sea apart from counterintuitive measures which means you go sideways in a rip you will be taken out to sea every year about a hundred people in the united states die because they don't pay attention to the warning signs that say stay out of the ocean dangerous riptide well years ago there was a man, older gentleman, who went to the beach with his family. He was not ocean savvy, saw the sign, and got in the water anyways. Got caught in the rip and was taken out to sea. His family could not do anything about it. He tried with all his might to get out, could not, figured he was going to die, and he just drifted out. Now, on the beach was a lifeguard who was paying attention. And he jumped in the water, swam out through the riptide, grabbed the dying man, pulled him sideways out of the current, and then brought him into the shore safe. 
The man had seen the warning signs, but he got in the water anyways. And yet regardless of his failure to pay attention, someone else paid attention, and he was saved. Now that's the gospel. That's the gospel. The radical self-centeredness of the human heart says, I'm not going to pay attention. I'm going to live my own life, my own way, and it blinds me to how my behavior affects you and other people, my family, my friends, my neighbors. I don't pay attention. But God does and did. And he comes to us in the person and work of Jesus Christ 400 years after this text is written. He comes to us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And Jesus lives a life that we should have lived and he dies a death we should have died. He pays attention. And at great cost to himself, he saves us from destruction through his life, death, and resurrection. So when we consider the book of Nehemiah, chapter 13, what is God telling us to do? Pay attention. Pay attention to your spiritual formation. Pay attention to the way you use power and authority and leadership. Pay attention to what you believe. Pay attention to your marriage. Pay attention to many things. But most of all, pay attention to God's grace. What is God saying to you today? Let's pray. I want to invite the worship team up very quietly. What is God saying to you today? Kind Father, the reality is I don't pay attention. And there are things in my life that slide, I let them go. Disciplines I should practice that I don't practice. Things I do that I shouldn't do. And I do it over and over and over again. And Lord, each one of us is the same. And Father, in this kind of disturbing text, I pray that you would open our hearts that we would pay attention, but most of all, that we would pay attention to grace, that we would anchor our life in who Christ is and what he's done. And if we pray these things in the beautiful name of Jesus, amen. Can we all stand as we continue to worship? Every heart
Long ago, I was uh, driving around my home, and I wasn't paying attention. And uh, I got pulled over from the police by the police after turning right where I wasn't supposed to. And so when he said, "Could I ask, you know, what's going on?" I said, "Well, you got me. You got me." And he looked at me and he said, "Just pay attention." And I went on. It's a wonderful act of God's grace. Listen, you know, this is, a, this is a hard word. This is a hard, this, I mean, this is the last chapter in the Old Testament, chronologically speaking. The last thing they got was this, Nehemiah 13. And it's a difficult reminder that most of us, we just don't pay attention. We just don't. I sure don't. And so this is an invitation to experience the grace of God in a profoundly real way, okay? Pay attention to grace. So, as we do this, go into this world in peace, share the gospel, take care of the poor and the marginalized, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen. God bless you, have a great day.